right, Mayor Ortiz. Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the City Council meeting for Burlingame for May 2nd. We're going to call the meeting to order at 7.01. And with that, we'll go straight to our Pledge of Allegiance. I've asked the Fire Chief to give us the uh, pledge of hoping the uh, City Clerk will allow him this time. And with those words, Mayor Ricardo Ortiz brought another City Council meeting to order. Hello everyone and welcome to another Burlingame It's a Small Town podcast sponsored by the Burlingame Historical Society. My name is Mark Lucchese, also known as Mark at the Mic, and today we are going up close and personal with the mayor of Burlingame, Ricardo Ortiz. Mr. Mayor, thank you for joining us today on Burlingame It's a Small Town podcast sponsored by the Burlingame Historical Society. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Mr. Mayor, uh, before we go on, can I just call you Ricardo? Oh, please. Yes. Thank you, Ricardo. Ricardo, I'm struggling a bit with my allergies. My voice is scratchy. I haven't done a podcast in about in a few weeks. I'm a little bit rusty, but I got to tell you, man, I'm fired up for this one. (laughs) I've been waiting for this one, and I hope you have been too, Ricardo. (laughs) I have too, yes. Great. So before we begin our interview, I'd like to tell our listeners a little bit about you. You were born in New York City, but at the age of three months, your parents moved back to Bogota, Colombia, where you grew up. You attended the American High School and learned to speak English. At the age of 18, your parents moved back to the States, where you finished your senior year at San Mateo High School. After graduating from San Mateo High, you attended the College of San Mateo, where you met your future wife, Lauren. Upon leaving CSM, you transferred to UC San Diego, where you majored in economics kind of a brainiac. You've been in banking for over 20 years with the most recent 10 years in Burlingame. You and your wife, Lauren, along with your two sons and daughter, have lived in Burlingame for over 20 years. You were elected to the city council in 2013 and served as mayor in 2017. Your list of volunteering and participating in local organizations is really too long for me to read, Ricardo, so I'm going to let you have an opportunity to share those in a moment. But before that, I'd like to tell our listeners that we met several years ago as members of the Burlingame Rotary Club. Mr. Mayor Ricardo Ortiz, you have the floor. Okay, first of all, yeah, I remember meeting you. We sat at the back table at the Rotary Club and made a lot of trouble back there. We had some fun. (laughs) Yes. We had fun. So uh, let me tell you a little bit. Okay, so um, I'll go back to a little bit of what you said. I grew up in Bogota, moved here, uh, did my my senior year in high school again, worked at San Mateo High School for many years while I was going to uh, junior college, uh, and then transferred to UC San Diego. When we moved back, my wife and I, she grew up in Millbrae, so she, but I think growing up, she spent most of her time in in Burlingame because she went to Our Lady of Angels and then Mercy Burlingame. Great. So she had a fascination with Burlingame. Our first place was a little condo in San Mateo on the wrong side of the railroad tracks. (laughs) Uh, And then after that, we moved to uh, Oak Grove down the street here, right near McKinley School. Yep. Uh, Today, that is a three-story apartment building or condo building, Uh, but it was great. It was a beautiful little charming house when we first moved in it was a busy street but it was great for when we first had our kids so we were uh sitting in the, we were sleeping in the kids room because we had painted our room the day that day and uh, that's when my wife uh started feeling contractions and so we went one month after we bought our little house in Burlingame my son Andres was born uh and then my daughter Veronica was born in that house too and then we moved to Ray Park. What happened was, and that was kind of my first connection with the city council or the city planning commission was at the time, uh, we had a notice that there was a large building being uh, proposed for behind our house. So it was, a, I believe, a four-story building on Floribunda that backed up against our house, and that would take care of our privacy. And so I went to the planning commission to complain about this building, and I forget what the name of it was of the commissioner. He looked at me and said, Mr. Ortiz, you're in banking. Did you not know that that lot was R3? <laughs> okay. And I said, uh, yeah, I did. And I kind of had to walk out with my tail between my legs and just say, <laughs> okay, fine. You, uh, we're going to build it, so we're just going to find a different place to live. So at that point, uh, there was, a, again, a, a local realtor who I knew from the Rotary Club, or not actually, not from the Rotary Club, he, he actually knew my wife growing up or when she was growing up, 
Anyway, Mike Horowitz uh, said to me, we're going to sell your house. We're going to get you a six-month uh, close of escrow so you have time to go buy another house. So that's exactly what we did. In 1998, we sold our house in early 98, and then we started making offers and offers and offers. We took every bit of those six months to find the new house, and really? we found a great house really? in, in Ray Park. Yeah, and, Ray Park's uh, lovely. 2001, we remodeled it, and we and that was my other connection to the planning commission where they were reviewing my plans, and there's one commissioner who didn't like them. So anyway, it was interesting. So I started kind of getting involved in things. and um, But the story goes like this, is at CSM, we had a professor, a math professor, both my wife and I, when she was walking out of trig, I was walking into calculus, and uh, her name was Rosalie O'Mahony. A longtime council person. And a mayor, many times so, mayor here in Burlington. So years later, we're sitting at OLA, Our Lady of Angels, uh, at the St. Patty's dinner, and we're looking across, and I said, Lauren, isn't that Dr. O'Mahony that's sitting right over there? He said, let's go over and say hi. And so we walked over and said hi to Rosalie, and uh, then she asked me to help her with some of her campaigns, and I ended up being chair of one of her campaigns, or maybe even two. Uh, and then I just kind of got the bug, and you just kind of get interested in it and start following it, following it. And then at one point, somebody gave me the crazy idea to run against two well known incumbents. <laughs> it's kind of like running full speed against a brick wall. Uh, it didn't work out well, it got a little bloody, but I learned a lot. And um, I had my friend Emily Matthews, who you know from the yep, Rotary from Club. Rotary. Yep. Uh, who helped me, and she was fabulous, had kind of some uh, crazy out-of-the-box uh, ideas on how to do the marketing, and and it was a lot of fun. Uh, we got a pretty good showing, and so I was kind of encouraged for the next time, but I said not until somebody quits. And so when I got word that uh, Kathy Baylock was not uh, running again, I decided to run again, and uh, and successfully that time, but it was an interesting one because there was nine candidates vying for three seats. Is that one of the most we've ever had? To my knowledge, yes. Yeah. I don't, I don't it's remember. Quite any a few other people one. running. Yeah. So, and two of those were Michael Brownrigg and Nan Keegan, both pretty well known. So, yes. or Anne O'Brien. Yeah. And uh, so, anyway, that was interesting. The, the the night of the election, I was ahead by ten votes. A few nights later, I was behind by uh, ten votes. And then at the final count, I was ahead by eight votes. Wow, we. So no when, it, when I say every vote counts, every vote every counts. Every vote counts. Yeah. So um, is all that counting done at, at uh, City Hall? Where is that done? Uh, Tower, um, Tower Road up the hill by uh, uh, San Mateo. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And it was it was really great. I went up there and did a a tour when they were doing all the vote counts, and yeah. they were talking about recounts and this and that. And so the person who gave me the tour was our current uh, city clerk, Megan hassel oh, yes. So She used to work up at the elections office. Really? And it was fun going there, just did a tour. She never, I always remembers her. So she yeah, showed me small around. Small world, how everybody kind of comes back around yeah, in so, a way. So would you say working with Rosalie O'Mahony was kind of your mo motivation to get into city government? Well, I, you know, I've always been fascinated by politics, and I, you know, I guess there's some family history. My, my grandfather was actually the mayor of Medellin, Colombia, back in the 60s. So, uh, and I think my mom was always fascinated by politics, and yeah. we always kind of followed it. Uh, and so, it, yeah, that, but as far as local politics, it started with her, and there's a few other people that I knew through Our Lady of Angels that were involved in. So I started to learn a little bit about the issues and a little bit about the personalities and yeah and then once you just and then I had been involved with a million uh, organizations oh, before gosh. I'm, I'm exaggerating I know but uh, I know but yeah so between the Rotary Club AYSO BC uh, and so I knew a lot of people in town and I talked around to a few people and they encouraged me to run and so that's you know, kind of yeah definitely it's... Rosalie Rosalie's connection was important yeah I, I think it's amazing that. You know, you lost your first time around, and you didn't get demotivated. It did not, you know, you got back up. And I think that's a real success story to me. Well, you know what? It's funny. I really enjoyed knocking on doors and talking to people and yeah. learning about the issues. And, uh, and that, you know, I think in a small city like this, that's really important. Yeah. Uh, and I actually, I actually enjoyed it. I think some people dread going around and knocking on doors. And, and when there were nine candidates, I think people were sick and tired of us, so they would like look at me and go, please, no more, get out of here. Uh, so, but yeah, I enjoyed it, and I, and I think the, the results, 
you know, we had pretty decent results of yeah. running against two well-known incumbents, like yeah. I said. And so, yeah, that was encouraging. So Good. So now that you are the mayor, can you tell us what the roles of a mayor are? Well, we get elected to the city council. So we're elected as a council member, and then we take turns being mayor. So there's a lot of little ceremonial things, a lot of ribbon cuttings, a lot of that. But as far as the uh, running the city, the city manager runs the city. The mayor is only what we do is we set the agenda, and then we run the meetings, which, as we were talking earlier, I enjoy doing because uh, – I uh, control the timing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. But pretty much that's the difference between the council member and the mayor is the mayor sets the agenda and the mayor runs the meetings. Okay. So that's kind of one of your strengths would be organizational skills, things like that? I, uh, I would think as far as running the meetings, as far as being able to listen to all sides yeah. and trying to kind of take what everybody's saying and put it in, into a concise concepts that people can, you know, because the staff's looking to us for direction. So being able to come up with five ideas and putting it into a, a cohesive uh, direction for a staff, I think I, I pride myself in that. I think I do a pretty good job, but you have to ask my counterparts. Prior to your meeting, like for example, last night, do you get together with your colleagues a half hour ahead of time, an well, hour ahead of time, do you discuss things ahead of time? You know, that's the funny, funny you should ask because I, when I was brand new, I wish I could have, right? Yeah. Because I wish I could have understood a little bit about different sides of it. But there's this thing called the Brown Act that precludes us from doing that. We're not allowed to talk to more than, in our case, because of the size of our board, we're not allowed to talk to more than one other person. Because that would be kind of collusion there it or would something? Be ex exactly. That's what yeah. the whole law was passed to avoid having decisions made in back smoke-filled filled rooms, like they used to say. So you're only allowed to talk to one. So uh, I, I, you know, I try to find somebody who, who I – a lot of times it's somebody who's an opposing view. I would try to call them. Um, but it, you're always limited to whatever, whoever they've talked to. If they've already talked to yeah. one person, then you're stuck. You can't, you can't talk to them about it. Yeah. Um, I often talk to Michael, and Michael and I kind of talk a lot, uh, uh, share ideas and, and concepts. But again, I wish if it wasn't for the Brown Act, I would pick up the phone and call both sides of the issue to kind of send, say, okay, what am I missing? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I, I, you know, I'd like to understand it so that when you make decisions, you know where you are. I, it, not that it's going to change my decision, but at least I understand the other side. So can you tell me a challenge that you have faced either as a council person or as the mayor and how you managed it? Well, let me tell you the, the story because there was a, the, uh, was a house up the hill uh, that was being appealed to us because the people didn't want, the neighbors didn't want it built. Uh, and there was somebody in there and, uh, and there's somebody I knew very well from being at the drama boosters at the high school when my daughter was involved in the drama program. And we, I know her very well. We both served on the board when I was president. She's a lovely, lovely person. And she was in the audience talking against this house. But the house met all the rules. The setbacks were right. The height, everything was met. So there's no reason that I could say no to the house. Yeah. And I'm looking at her, and it killed me to go against someone that I knew right. that really well. And, it, 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 and then, anyway got over with it and I think after a while I learned that no matter what I do every time I make a decision somebody's going to be upset yeah you can't and, please everybody and you right? can't please everybody and you you have to get a little thick skin and get over it but that was really hard for me that that was I remember that time especially there was other times there was one with a with a tree that we decided to take down where where I knew a lot of the people who were against it, but it was the right thing to do. So. Was that a eucalyptus tree on El Camino or something? No, or? no, this was a large uh, uh, evergreen, a, a redwood tree that was in the back of somebody's yard, but it was it was huge. The arborists have told us that as it was growing, it was getting more dangerous every day, and it was one of the things I do believe we are the city of trees. Trees are not perfect. Trees will break streets yeah. up. There's yeah. things that they do, but on some occasions they have to come down because they were beyond beyond the nuisance they were dangerous and they were uh and the, i mean these people's yard was completely overtaken by this tree but the neighbors were really upset because the tree was beautiful it was big and people sure, they sent, hate to part with the tree they sent us videos they <laughs> sent us it was it was it was a tough decision i bet and it, again, was. it was tough going against people that i know and truly like and respect their opinions but it was the right thing to do did this happen while you were mayor or council person on the council 
I don't remember that yeah. being mayor. Though. Okay. So let me ask you this. <clears throat> what are the top three issues or complaints that you have received during your term? Um, right now, the biggest complaint that we get is that we're building too much. And, um, and, and, and you know, we have to allow a certain amount of housing to be built in town just because it is a requirement by the state. Uh, and I think we've managed to do that without disrupting our traditional neighborhoods, which I'm really proud about. Uh, but that is the biggest complaint, is, uh, is we're building too much. So would building too much mean like building the parking lot on Lorton mm -hmm. or the building that's going up across the street from Christie's Restaurant next to the train depot? Is that what people are upset well, about? Well, I mean, kind of all of the above. I, I, we did receive complaints about the parking lot, mostly about the lights on the parking lot. Uh, people saying that they were too bright, uh, but but that hasn't been the problem. Most of the, the problem is the big developments that are going on. Uh, like there was one on ba on on, on um, right on the other side of the railroad tracks here. Uh, there's a few projects there that have been uh, uh, kind of difficult, uh, and then we have some of the other projects that we have coming up on El Camino uh, across the street where, from where I work. Uh, near the hospital that are going to be some pretty large residential projects. Yeah. Uh, and people just feel that we have a lot of a lot of people moving to town. There's going to be a lot of congestion and not enough parking. And, yeah. and that's the complaint that we've had. Well, uh, we're going to get to some of that housing shortly because I'm still throwing you a few softballs. The heat comes in a little while. Okay. I've got my glove on. Okay, good. So what downward trend in Burlingame's last five years are you and the council most proud of? A downward trend is less crime, homeless issues going away. I don't know if we ever had a homeless issue here in Burlingame. Well, that one comes and goes. It's it's not, but it, we do have a problem, and we do you know we try to do as much as we can in a humane way, and we work with uh, the county and with local organizations to deal with that. But um, you know what? I, I got to tell you, the most. I don't know when you say downward trend. It's not really a downward trend, but. I'm really proud of the way we've managed to weather this whole storm of the uh, COVID, uh, how we were able to help our, our citizens and help our small businesses uh, and our, our, our finances. And I think the finances speak to how conservative we were and how we, we put money aside for this uh, uh, downturn. Yep. And I think that we were coming out of it you know we're 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 limping, but we're still moving, and yep. I think it's a it's a you can go back to some of the councils prior to us and what we've done in the past and being very conservative and putting money away. Our one of our biggest sources of income was our hotel taxes. Our hotel taxes went from somewhere around twenty nine million to zero, probably, huh? To seven million. Yeah. Okay. Boy. So you think about this twenty nine million to seven million yep. when when our total. Uh, general fund is about 80 million. That's a huge hit. And we've always treated that revenue as something that's very volatile. Mm -hmm. And we knew it w when it goes, it goes. And so we were ready for that. And I think that we did a really good job. Thank you for the uh, our property taxes continue to go up and our sales taxes continue to go up and made up a little bit of that difference. Yeah. Uh, and we've had to put off some of the uh, capital improvement projects that we had. Uh, but all in all, we're in really good shape. How's the revenue from Auto Row been? Or how was that through the pandemic and then coming out now? Uh, initially, it took a little hit, the sales taxes from Auto Row. And then uh, I think now we're, we're, uh, we're close to pre-pandemic levels on our right. sales taxes, if, if, if not a little bit above. So yeah. we, were, we were doing pretty well. And I don't know how much is collected um, with the parking meters, but I know you turned them off for two years, right, during the oh, whole yeah, thing? Oh, yeah, and that was... Uh, so that had to be a little bit of a chunk of change. That was, and then some of them are still off because we have the parklets that we put in place. That's right. And, and initially the parklets were free because we were doing this in the emergency to help the... the Which uh, was amazing for two years, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and so we came up with a plan to make it a permanent program, mm -hmm. and part of that plan was, you know, we have to collect to make up for what we're not taking sure you in. you do. You shut down meters. And when people are making money off it being on public land, we yep. need to collect rent. Yep. We cannot give you free access to public land yep. to make money off of. And also there was an issue with the cleaning because the cleaning is not as easy. You don't just drive a car through it because you, there are parklets there. So we need yep. to have people with 
power cleaner. So we added a, an annual fee and a cleaning fee. And, uh, and people who didn't feel they needed them have removed them, which returned the parking. So if you're truly not using them, you're not going to pay for them, and then we can get our parking back. And yeah. I think we're, we found a pretty happy medium, and I think that going forward, I think it's a great program. I think people enjoy sitting outdoors. I personally love going to some of these well, restaurants and sitting outdoors. Well, I think it's outdoors. great on wonderful days like that. And oh, some yeah. people still aren't comfortable going indoors. You're right. They like to sit outdoors. So yeah. it was a great thing. So when city residents uh, see, see you, Ricardo, they're, you know, you're on the street, you're with your wife and the kids, and you're walking up uh, Burlingame Ave or Broadway, well, how do they usually come up to you? They say, do they come up with you with a complaint or a compliment, or they just say, well, hello, Ricardo, how are you? And, you know, are you getting praise, or, you know, what, what's the deal when, when you meet people on the street? Most of the time, I mean, I, I rarely have strangers walk up to me and say, hello, Mr. Mayor, I have this or that or the other. So usually it's people that I know. And so they'll say, you know, they'll just say, hi, Ricardo, and usually they'll share their concerns with this or that or the other. Um, but mostly whenever people have concerns, the majority of the time that I get the complaints or the, uh, uh, the issues come through email. Yeah. Uh, so rarely, and I think people are pretty, very respectful that they're, they're, when I'm talking, my kids don't hang out with me much anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling. It's mostly, it's yeah. mostly when I'm walking, and we, and we do a lot of walking with yeah. my wife and a few friends. And so when I see people when I'm walking, they'll say, hey, I'll c c give you a call. I have some things I need to talk to you about. Yeah. But rarely do they come up in the street and just kind of blurt out whatever it is. That's which, nice. Which is really nice. That's nice, yeah. yeah. Is the city of Burlingame facing any budget cutbacks this year? And if so, how are those cutbacks being handled? The, the only, like I said earlier, the only thing is we're putting off some of our uh, capital improvement projects that we would otherwise be gung-ho on uh, uh, just putting them off for until the revenues recover. Yeah. Um, but no, other than that, we are just marching along. And Good. again, it's a... It, because of the way things were handled in the past that we are in such a good shape that we did not increase our expenses you beyond what we needed. Yeah. You did and some I'm repairing. I'm really proud of that. Yeah, you should be. So you and the other council members have been on the council for quite a while. What are some of the pros and cons in working with each other for several years? Listen, we have, we're very lucky in the city of Burlingame, and I don't know that people sometimes don't realize that this is a volunteer uh, uh, occupation. It's not... We get a small stipend, but it's really not enough to call it a salary. Um, so you have f four individuals that are my counterparts. They're all, all of them very smart, very dedicated. They truly believe in the best, what's best for the city of Burlingame. And, uh, and we'll have some disagreements, and we do have them all the time, and then we continue to work in a very civil manner. I think that uh, there's other councils in surrounding cities where that's not the case. That makes life very difficult for citizens and difficult for staff. We have a very cordial relationship. We, uh, why is it good? I think it gets to a point where you really know. I, I, I'll, I'll read the agenda and I can tell you how each one of my counterparts is going to vote. Uh, I have a pretty good idea and and if, if I disagree with something, I will, after the meeting, because of the Brown Act, I will pick up the phone and talk to people and say, I, you know, I don't agree with how you voted with that, and this is why, blah, 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 blah. And a lot of times uh, we'll talk it out. But it's never personal. We, there's never personal attacks. There's never any, uh, anything that you, know, you kind of have a hard time talking to these people again. We're Good. very, very fortunate. Yeah. It's a nice team. Guys have been working together for yeah. quite a while. So what do you think of the some of the cities around here have gone to an elected mayor? How do you feel about that? I like the idea, but when we were talking about the districts and going into districts, we were, uh, because of state law and the uh, threat of a lawsuit, we were kind of pushed into going to the districts. Um, and uh, you might not hear from my tone that I wasn't crazy about the whole idea, but here we are. When we were doing that, one of the things that we considered was going to four districts and an at-large mayor, which I thought would have been a really good idea because that mayor would have kind of taken the f view of the whole city while the other f people would have their districts more in mind. We didn't do that. Now we're going to the five districts. So I think there's pros and cons. I think in San Bruno, they're, uh, they've been doing it for many years, uh, and now they're talking about getting rid of it. So... Mm -hmm. um, 
Well, has Burlingame ever had an elected mayor? It's always been the city council rotating, right? Correct. That's, that's as far as I remember, as far back as yeah. I know, that's the way it has been. So, now. what's that saying? If it's not uh, broken, don't fix it. I guess. Aim broke, don't fix. Yeah. Okay. So you put on your glove because I've thrown you all the softballs I have. Now we're going to throw the heat. Okay. Mm-hmm. Affordable housing. When and where and what does affordable mean? Can a school teacher in Burlingame? Uh-huh. Jeez. qualified to purchase a home. Well, you know, the, the funny thing about that is, you know, when people in other parts of the country look at what we consider the medium income and, and the, what affordable is, you know, 80% of that, uh, and you're talking about 110000 a year as somebody who's a, a, a moderate income, it sounds really silly, but there, here we are. Uh, you know, I know what it takes to buy a house because I do it for a living, right? I know right. what it takes to get to qualify for a loan. Right. It is impossible. The thought of my kids buying the, a home around mine here. Mine won't be my next door neighbor. Yeah, I, mean, I know just, that. Just the yeah. thought, just imagine trying to buy your house today. Well, you can't do it. Right. Okay. So, you know, if my, you know, if I had to come up with, you know, minimum $600,000 plus a, you know, Twenty thousand dollar payment. Never mind that. Think of property taxes. That's what scares me the most. You think about it. I could pay off everything. I, I still have two thousand dollars a month in property taxes. It's crazy. It, it's 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 absolutely crazy. So, so when you talk about the people that we have working for the city or the schools, it's very difficult. I mean, you talk about some people who we used to think was a good living. Well, nowadays you can't afford to buy anything. I mean, not yeah. a condo. And and so. It's it's a really difficult subject because the reality is the city is not the one who builds these, the, the, you know, the housing units. It's developers. It's, it's private parties are the people who build it. So we can't. Although we did do it with a parking lot over here, and I'll get to that in a second. But in general terms, we have to make an environment so that people can build these houses, and we can provide some affordable housing. And and part of what we do is create opportunities for additional housing and by creating more housing we're going to cr- try to change the equation on the affordability side but it's very difficult because we're still building 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 and they're still going for you know millions of dollars so. yeah so speaking of that t- tell me the location is it on carolyn or is it on rollins where is a- affordable housing being built it's not being built in the neighborhoods is it park Park. So if you think of where St. Catharines is, yeah. so in Park, right there, there used to be a city lot, and now it's a like, four-story building. Yes. That is all affordable. That's 136 units of affordable housing. But it gets better than that. We took a parking lot. It was an at-surface parking lot, which in this area, with the price of land, it's kind of a real waste of uh, opportunity. We took that and allowed them to build that project there, and then they built us our parking lot that we have in return. So now we ended up with affordable housing, more parking than we started out with, and uh, I think that was a brilliant thing that we did, and I pat on my own back. Why not? Uh, And I'll give kudos to uh, Vice Mayor Brownrigg because he was the one who came up with the whole concept of these at at surface parking lots are a waste of uh, land. Yeah. And, uh, And I think that's part of how this whole idea kind of gelled is from that concept. Okay, so now tell me about this surveillance camera issue that has come about recently. I'm, I'm really not well schooled on it. it. I heard it was controversial. Why? Can you tell me what it was about? So, so it, it, first of all, a lot of the cities around San Mateo County do this already. So it's not anything new. It's not something that city, the city of Burlingame is coming up with. But the police department said, you know, th- this is the technology that exists. If we can put cameras on um, most of the major intersections, those cameras will read the license plate number and in some cases will report it back to the police in the cases of stolen cars or abductions or that kind of amber alerts. Those license plates will be sent and there will be an alert sent to the police department. Other than that, there's a database of all these license plates that's kept for 30 days. So if there's some sort of uh, crime happening in town, we can use them to try to identify any suspects of uh, cars leaving town or going in that area. Why is it controversial? Because I think people feel that it's an, uh, that you're attacking people's civil liberties by, by, uh, and their privacy by taking that information. Uh, but in, in my view, I voted it for it, and I've been for it for a long time. When you're driving your car out in the street, you can't assume that nobody's looking at your license plate, whether they're taking it down with a pen and paper or they're taking it down with a, a camera electronically. 
yes, of course, this is reading a lot more cameras and, and we're keeping a database of that information, which is what makes people uncomfortable. So what is the answer is we create some rules on how we use this data, how we use it, how long we keep it, who do we share it with. Uh, and that is what makes it so that it's not, we're not abusing it and, uh, and we're going to keep tabs on it and we're going to look at it periodically to see how we're doing. So it's passed. Has it gone into effect? Well, I just spoke to the police chief. It's funny because uh, Chief Matucci was just telling me, because during the meeting, every time he got an opportunity to speak, the number of cameras kept increasing. Yeah. So <laughs> what I happened, imagine it's costly. What happened is he said that it's actually going to be a lot smaller the amount of cameras that are needed. And I guess mm -hmm. the technology is such that you don't have to have many cameras in the same intersection so it's actually going to be a smaller amount so they're they're right now looking at locations uh they are solar powered so they look they have to find locations that are not only somewhere where they can actually place the camera but that it's not shaded so that they can get enough sun to run the camera uh and uh and so that's what they're doing right now and implementation is roughly six months great great good to hear so are you still getting any pushback on the traffic circle? Uh, I know I, that was kind of a deal there for a while, but... Uh, I have my friend Paige, who uh, every chance she gets, she reminds me how awful the, <laughs> the roundabout is. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I, you know, I'm going to have to disagree with her. I think most of the people who were really opposed to it uh, have come to understand that it was a good solution for that intersection. Yeah, uh, it, It's... And again, those of us who grew up in other parts of the world have been dealing with roundabouts of forever and ever and, and ever. Course, yep. And uh, it's kind of a new concept here. Yeah. But I think after people got used to the roundabout, I, I think there, there's the one street, and I'm sorry, I think it's Edwards, I think it's the street that comes out from right here from the library. Um, well, there's Primrose. Oh, is it Douglas? Douglas. Douglas, yeah. Uh, and the way that one, whenever you used to have to go from there to cross to go uh, north on... Good luck. It was, it was dangerous. Good luck. Now, the yeah. other thing is if you watch people crossing it on foot, it, it's so much safer now yeah. that they get to cross it on foot. Yeah. Uh, so I think for every reason, I think it was a good thing. Uh, and so, yeah, I guess, yeah, do I get complaints about it? Yeah, Paige. Yeah, good. <laughs> so how's the parking lot on Lorton going? I think it's wonderful, to be honest with you. It's a block and a half away from Burlingame Avenue, but it always seems like there's a lot of vacancies. There. A lot of vacancies. But here's the funny thing. If you're in San Francisco and you park two blocks away from where you're going, you think you, you died and care. went to heaven, right? right? That's like the you're best thing happy. that happened to yep. you. Yep. But here in Burlingame, if you have to park half a yep. block away, it's, that's oh, like, oh, goodness. there's no parking right, in this no town. Parking. It's so crowded, nobody goes Is there. Is there anything Remember? you can do to promote it? Uh, yeah, we have talked about signage and yeah. uh, and the things like that. So um, it, it's people are starting to get used to it. Yeah. I think people are starting to understand that walking from there to, um, you know. I just think it's amazing, to be so, honest with you. So I, I don't like the parallel park, so I'll park in the neighborhoods. But now that this place has opened up, I just park there. It's yeah, and it, I, it's, I do the same thing, especially yeah. because of the electric vehicle parking uh, I, I just go in and plug the car in. Yep. I don't need not, not to get a lot of charge for lunch, but it, it's, it's yep. still nice to have. So how about a town square update? Oh, well, I, I just hope everybody looks at the video because it's really, really cool the way they moved a piece of the, uh, of the uh, old post office. The new Sarah's Regis, the developer, they sent me a copy of this video. What they did is they basically kind of cut the end of the of the post office and shifted it over on these rails, and it's sitting there. You can see there's a big thing sitting on uh, on the construction site, covered in tarps, and that's the old post office. And what they're going to do is once they put the building up, they're going to slide it back in and make it part of the building. So that that was part of the deal, though, because it's a landmark. Is that it was correct? it was required by the, yeah. by the, when the post office was sold because yeah. it is a historical building. Yeah. So it's the, the idea was to keep a portion of it. I always look at this uh, the feral house as the perfect example of how to do something where you keep a historic building Absolutely. and make it useful. So this was a kind of a similar idea, uh, but uh, Sarah's Regis has just been wonderful to work with, and they're, they're, they're doing very respectful of the historical uh, nature of it. And so then once they get that done, then we'll have our little plaza that's going to come up there, and I, man, it's going to be really great to have events and everything. We'll have, we'll have a... Will you do me a favor then for myself and my fellow senior citizens? Will you find a place that you guys can put a restroom in there because... 
man, sometimes I got to go and I never know where to go around it. Okay, so think about that. Bring that bring that up. I'll send you guys an email and you can discuss <laughs> yeah, so, it at the yeah. next council. Or you meeting. catch me walking on okay. the street with my kids. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so here's one that I know that you're kind of excited about, the community center. The, oh. the old recreation center, which is now a gorgeous, I can't wait to get in there, rec, uh, community center is what we're calling it. So. Okay, so when I was brand new to the council, right I mean, seriously, I don't think I'd had a, one single council meeting. I was assigned to the Citizens Oversight or Citizens Advisory Committee to sit down and, and talk about how we were going to put this together. And we sat with people in the community. We talked about different ideas of how we were going to do, what we were going to include. Did it include basketball courts or not basketball courts? Did it include this and that dance and this and that? And we came up with a idea of what we needed in there and from that we came up with uh, different ideas about the architecture and then we had C4 the uh, architectural firm they're fabulous they've been great with us uh, at some point somebody they showed us this modern look and everybody's like oh this is Burlingame I don't know if that's right a I can look. only imagine and, the oh, first my God, and we were kind of nervous about that <laughs> And uh, and I think we were pretty bold in the city council and said, no, you know, that's a good look for that park because that with all the windows opening to see all the trees and everything in there, it's a great look. And uh, and uh, I think there are some people in the community who were kind of concerned that there, and I, I think some people would have rather have a look like the old train station, going to have the, the uh, that historical look. I, I, I kind of struggled with it a little bit at first, but then when this showed up and with all the windows, I said, no, that's the way to go. And now that I go by it, I said, thank you. Yep. Thank God we did it. That I way. have to thank for any newcomers coming to Burlingame that buy homes here and they've never been here. You know, they never saw the old place. They see this place. They're going to go, oh, my God, that's oh, amazing. That's great. Right? Wait, wait till you go inside. Oh, I can't yeah, wait. And there's a great place for seniors there, so get oh, ready. <laughs> that's what I hear, Ricardo. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. So, um, so what's the deal with the rumors of the Burlingame Plaza selling? Is that true? Is that selling out down there? What's going on? You're not at liberty to say. I can see it. I, I can uh, see it. Did you get that on video, Ray? I hope so. <laughs> there are rumors of uh, a developer going around and trying to buy the seven different parcels that make up the plaza. It's not one owner. It's multiple owners. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so what I've heard is that they were talking about doing some office buildings uh, that in, there were life signs, which it seems to be the thing these days, and some uh, residential, and that they would keep some of the uh, uh, retail stores, and they were just relocating them. So they yeah. were talking about different options and how to relocate everything. So is that kind of a hot topic right now? Are you getting emails on that? Are you getting phone calls? I'm, Are I'm, you getting? No, nobody knows about that until it hits the uh, planning commission. So okay. Uh, there is nothing that I have seen that's been in writing or any anything submitted. But are you to getting Planet questions Commission. from people asking you about it, like um, I just did? No, not, not really? really. No, okay. except for except for we have a lot of the people who come into the bank. Which I, I mean, I work in the plaza, so there's people who come into the bank asking me what the future is for the bank. So, yeah, uh, that's about the uh, extent of it. Okay, okay. So what about? Uh, marijuana warehouse coming to Burlingame. Is there any validity to that? Is that true? Um, we, it is legal now, Mr. Lucchese. I know it is. It's fine. I don't have an issue. I'm just what Are we having a warehouse coming? Uh, we had conversations with a, uh, somebody who was interested in opening it. I don't believe that that has moved forward, but uh, if it did, we have it uh yeah. It, it. So let's just talk about that for a second. Not too long. Because it is legal, has anybody asked to open a pot shop on Burlingame Ave? No. Nothing? No. And, and uh, I, I think the, uh, the way we uh, limited the uh, activity, it, there, there's just so much they can do. Yeah. So the, uh, what this was was a transportation business where they would do uh, deliveries from there. Okay. Uh, and but as far as a retail, no retail, no. Yeah. Okay. And what's going on with Top Golf? We are in final negotiations with them uh, as far as the lease. I think it should be coming the next couple uh, of city council meetings. Uh, hopefully we get shovels to the ground while I'm still mayor because I keep telling the city attorney, you can't let me go to the next one. I want to be the one with a shovel. <laughs> That's right. So we're hoping, we're hoping 
hoping by the end of the year we'll be ready to start. So, that'd be great. Boy, that'd and be great it's for the gonna city. It's going to be huge for the city. Not, yeah. not only in revenues, uh, it'll be great for the hotels. hotels. The I just hotels are can't big imagine those, all those people that are going to be in the hotels that can get go right there to Top Golf and have a great. blast. Have you ever been? Never, I, but I've seen video. Oh. I don't. Was there one in San Jose? I think there was. There is one now in San Jose. When we yeah. made the decision, I had to go all the way to Roseville to uh, to hit some balls and, and check it out. And it's a great. It's a great facility. It's yeah, going to be a I lot was, of fun. I was in Southern California recently, and uh, Los Angeles was making a big to do that they're finally getting a Top Golf down there. So. Oh yeah, it's, it's good nice. stuff. So okay, so it's two years now and uh no in-house meetings it's all been zoom and i know you've got a lot of zoom going on not just with city council but probably with your banking and all the the uh, affiliations that you have with city council how do you like the zoom meetings um so let me start when you talk about the affiliations i'm so i'm represent Burlingham to a number of regional boards yes you do one of them is the ccag which is i'm the vice chair of ccag and uh, and that's an association of governments and the city cities in the in the county and the county, and we get together and talk about transportation, water, and a few other things. And uh, that I would drive to San Carlos every time we had a meeting, so that avoids that drive. I think there's less vehicle miles traveled. <laughs> I think it's good for the environment that yep. we don't all do that. And for me, go from Burlingham to San Carlos is not terrible, but there's people who come from the coast. Of course. So. So for certain regional boards, that has been a godsend. Yeah. I mean, it has been really wonderful. Uh, then I have the the airport roundtable, which I don't really have to go too far when it's in, in person. I go to Millbrae, and I, li I live very close to the border, so I, that's not hard for me to do. But again, we have people who are traveling from Palo Alto, from Menlo Park, from to go to the roundtable. So for them, for everybody, these have been great. So we're hoping that Sacramento comes up with a, a way to let us do this going forward. Because what happens is if we decide that the emergency is over with, we're required to go back to, because of the Back to the Brown Act, mm -hmm. we're required to go back to it, live meetings. So I know there's a bill floating in Sacramento that talks to about the possibility of creating some uh, compromise somewhere in between where we can uh, still do those. And I, I hope it passes. I, I, I like the technology. I think it's been really interesting. It's funny because... The in-person meetings are better for the elderly, but the, these have really brought in a lot of uh, oh, participation with imagine. young people yep. who otherwise would not go to they city hall. Go, but this way you could so, just flip on your So we could come computer. up with a hybrid where we could still have it in in-person so that people come to city hall and have yep. say their piece, and then we still have it so people can do, do uh, messages electronically or participate electronically. I think it would be great. So hopefully that bill goes through and we can do that but great. i like it i do I, I like the technology i've gotten used to it uh, yeah uh and um but i do miss being at city hall and of having course. uh the I interaction think there's a, there's a lot that happens before the meetings when you say hi to people you talk to people yep. uh and then a little bit after the meetings where you say yep. talk to people which i kind of miss yeah i bet so what's the one thing you wish pe people knew about burlingame that is the best place to live in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true mayor. Okay, no, but I'll tell you what. I'll tell you the real, the truth of the matter is I'm, I'm, for me, the weather is perfect. You know what? You go a little further north, you go to my mother-in-law's house, it's a little too cold up there. Yep. <laughs> you yep. go a little further south, a little too hot. Yeah. So we're blessed with the perfect weather because we're right at the end well, of the fog. We're bank. very blessed. Yeah. Uh, we're blessed with the geography. We're close to San Francisco, but not too close. Right. So you want to go to the opera? You can go, but you don't have to deal with some of their problems that they deal with all the time. Yeah. You want transportation? We have SF, you know, SFO right there. You have Caltrain. You have BART. You have everything you need. Seriously, you want to go to the beach? Drive one hour. No, not one hour. Drive 20 minutes. Yeah. Want to go to the snow? Three hours away. You know... You know, yes, it is the best place to live in the United States. I will stick to that one. I like that. So I'm a young guy out of college. <coughs> I live in Bray. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but I'm interested in maybe getting into uh, city politics or getting on the city council. Okay. What advice do you have for a young person that wants to seek a position? Well, I, I, I think that here's the funny thing. We're not doing it for the money. Right. So what my advice is first, make sure you have the calling. You, you need to want to do it for the right reasons. You, you, uh, I mean, there's things that, that 
kind of that when I watched this way things were done that kind of bothered me that I thought you know what I could probably go and do that better and after serving in a lot of nonprofits you learn how to you got to be part of the meeting learn how to listen to everybody get consensus and move things forward but you have to have that calling because it's not about the money it's not a truly we really don't have that much power there's no it's not about the power. It's really about wanting to serve your community. And if you if you have that, then you're going to do well. If you're doing it for any other reason, then you're just fooling yourself. One should get involved like you did, though, right, with AYSO and Little League and, and the schools and everything. I mean, you have to begin a network, right, to, to get people. Well, if you want to get elected, you probably want to get your face out there and have people know your name. And, yeah. uh, uh, and, and I think a lot of people, I think uh, uh, Anne, Michael, Donna, uh, all served in commissions before. There's, uh, Anne and Michael were in the Planning Commission. Donna was in the uh, in the Parks and Rec Commission. So that's very helpful because then you understand how the process works. You understand some of the issues. Yep. And then uh, Emily served uh, as president of BCE, so she had been involved in the community for years. So, but again, I think everybody who's on there has a calling and has a, a an altruistic reason to be there. And it's not so. If if you don't have that, don't do it because you're going to be frustrated. Yeah. Are you working every night after you leave the bank? Are you doing mm-hmm. something for the city every night? Mm-hmm. Are you, you know what I mean? Are you, you're going to meetings or on Zoom or do you ever have a free night? Oh yeah, my dog would miss me. I got to take her out for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, no, it's not every night. It, it's, uh, there's some weeks like, uh, there's some weeks where uh, pretty much every night, but then there's other weeks where it's only one night a yeah. week or something like that. Yeah. It's, uh, there's some weeks that it's overwhelming, but um, in general, it's not. It's manageable. Yeah. Do you have any aspirations for running uh, for office beyond city council? You know what? I enjoy doing this. If I could get paid to do this, <laughs> <laughs> that would be really nice. But um, I, there's very few opportunities uh, uh, to go above, so... If one should present itself and the timing was right and uh, I felt I had the support, yes, I would do that. Good for you. Yeah. Good. Okay, we're down to my last question. It's one that's... Uh, but let me say one more thing about what you just said. Let me interrupt because I... It's Go right I ahead. Get so just recently I made the decision to run for re-election. Yep. So now I had, because uh, I think it's July is when we have to submit papers... So I made the decision very recently, and I am, and this is where I'm announcing it publicly. <laughs> great. That well, I am running for District 1. I think it's great that you are, and you'd be crazy not to, okay? You've done well as a councilman and as a mayor. So Thank you. I appreciate absolutely. that. Okay, so I've come to my final question, um, one I that I always kind of keep a secret. Um, if heaven exists, what would you like God to say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Ah, oh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I, I would, I guess I would really like to hear. Okay, I would like him to say you were a good father, a good husband, a good friend, and you did very good things for your community. So, and then I'd like to see him swing the door open and let me <laughs> in. <laughs> And how. So, uh, Ricardo, I'm going to say this from the bottom of my heart, and I really mean this. You are a success story, okay? What was it, three months old, going back to Columbia, studying English down there, come back at 18 years old, graduate from San Mateo High, UC UC San Diego, degree in economics. Ravel College, I just think it's amazing, man. So congratulations (laughs) on that. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you so much for being part of this podcast tonight. it's been an honor. Thank you, Ricardo. And Mark, thank you for doing this. I've listened to your other podcasts, and they're awesome. So I encourage everybody to just listen to them all. And you've done great things for this community, so <laughs> I appreciate it. And thank we you, all Ricardo. do. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our mayor, Ricardo Ortiz, for being our guest today on Burlingame. It's a small town. Thanks to my videographer, the great Ray Tyler, Shelby, and Kathy for producing and editing, and our musical director, Bray. You can hear more of Bray at Bray.com. The Burlingame Historical Society copyrights this video podcast and no part of this program can be rebroadcast or copied without permission. So until next time, everyone, see you around Burlingame. It's a small town.